Here is an idea. A get-rich-quick scheme, no experience at all. On the day before Thanksgiving in 1971, a man using the name Dan Cooper bought a $20 one-way ticket from Portland to Seattle. He paid in cash. He boarded the plane, sat towards the back, and ordered a bourbon and soda. When the plane took off, he handed the flight attendant a note. She put it away without looking at it. She assumed he was trying to give her his number. She was used to businessmen trying to flirt with her. But when the man saw that she didn't look at it, he leaned over and whispered, Miss, you'd better look at that note. I have a bomb. The note told her to sit down beside him, and when she did, the man opened his briefcase. Inside, there were eight red cylinders attached to wires. The flight attendant took the man's demands to the pilot. When the plane landed, he wanted $200,000 and four parachutes. Once the plane landed, the man let all of the passengers disembark. But he kept the crew on as hostages. He demanded that they take off again, this time in the direction of Mexico City. And 45 minutes into the flight, the man strapped the cash to himself and jumped off the plane. Search parties looked for the man in the cash for days, but they couldn't find either. He had just disappeared. It was all over the news, although the hijacker's pseudonym, Dan Cooper, was misreported as D.B. Cooper. He's still never been found. It's been 47 years. 28-year-old Martin McNally was driving with a friend in Detroit when he heard about D.B. Cooper on the radio. At that particular time, I uh, laughed uh, very loud, and I told my uh, friend uh, that uh, that's not a bad way to make some money. Martin thought, how hard could it be? If D.B. Cooper could do it, he could too. I had no experience being on the planes. Uh, I never put on a parachute, uh, and I never owned a gun. Martin was unemployed. He'd worked a series of jobs after being discharged from the Navy years earlier. He'd tried a few small-time scams. Once he got busted putting fake quarters into a laundromat change machine, nothing had really worked out. So he threw himself into trying to figure out how to hijack an airplane. First, he went to the local library. Spent about five hours uh, pulling out uh, uh, books on uh, parachuting and World War II uh, adventures uh, in flying and so forth. And it took about four hours to uh, come across the calculation that I wanted. And it was an algebraic calculation to determine terminal velocity. And once I had that, uh, I wrote down the uh, formula and left and went home. Martin did all of the calculations himself, figuring out how high above the ground the plane should be and how fast it should be going for him to safely jump out and open a parachute. He was most concerned with how long he would have after the jump before he needed to open the parachute. He figured he had about 15 to 20 seconds. The next step was to find the right airport. For five months, Martin scouted airports across the Midwest. He visited Indianapolis, Chicago, St. Louis, and Kansas City. He finally chose St. Louis's Lambert Airport, He thought it had the worst security. He visited two more times to prepare. He bought a ticket with forged Navy discharge papers under the name Robert Wilson. And on the afternoon of June 23, 1972, he walked into the airport, went up to the counter, gave the agent his ticket, and boarded the plane. We didn't go through any metal detectors at this time. If there had been metal detectors, I wouldn't have been on that plane period. So I was able to get on the plane. and With a uh, gun? W- yeah, with, with my, uh, I had a uh, sawed-off uh, rifle. It looked like a World War II grease gun. And I had a pistol, and I had a uh, smoke grenade, uh, and I was dressed uh, like a businessman, suit and tie and sport coat, sunglasses. Didn't have my wig on at that time. Sat down, and we, uh, we took off. 
Martin McNally was planning to jump out of a plane 10,000 feet in the air, going 500 miles an hour, and had almost no idea what he was doing. I'm Phoebe Judge. This is Criminal. More than 130 American planes were hijacked between 1968 and 1972. Sometimes there was more than one case of air piracy on the same day. Anyone could have tried it. Uh, anyone could have tried it. And uh, quite frankly, a lot of people were doing it, doing it back then. During the 1960s, it was most common for people to board planes and demand to be taken to Cuba. People trying to leave the United States to make a political statement, but also criminals seeking ransom payments. Airline companies and the U.S. government came up with some unusual solutions. Pilots flying to any destination were provided with charts outlining routes to Havana, just in case. Hijackings to Cuba were so common that in 1968, Time magazine published an article advising passengers to just stay calm and enjoy the mojitos. It included tips for the best hotels and cigar shopping. The federal government went so far as to consider building a fake version of the Havana airport in Florida so hijacked planes could land there instead. The Federal Aviation Administration formed an anti-hijacking task force and solicited ideas from the public. The public made suggestions like installing trap doors, arming flight attendants with tranquilizer darts, and making everyone on the plane wear boxing gloves so no one could hold a gun. The obvious solution was to just screen passengers with a metal detector. But airlines thought the inconvenience of walking through a metal detector outweighed the inconvenience of being threatened at gunpoint 10,000 feet in the air. Airlines argued that increased security would be bad for business, Customers didn't want to wait in line or feel like criminals on their way to vacation. So, on the afternoon of June 23, 1972, when Martin breezed onto his flight at the St. Louis airport, he didn't expect any trouble at all. We took off and uh, we're on our way to uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And about 15 minutes out of Tulsa, the pilot came on the uh, intercom. And he said, we'll be landing in about 15 minutes. So uh, I uh, sat there and I said, this is it. i got to make a decision. If if I land in uh, Tulsa and don't pull this uh, thing right now, I'm going to be stuck in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So I said, you either pump up your uh, gonads or forget about it. So I uh, asked the guy uh, where the restroom was in the plane uh, and said it's in the back on the right-hand side. So... I picked up my attaché case very cautiously and headed to the bathroom, went in the bathroom, closed the door, locked the door, and uh, opened the uh, attaché case, uh, pulled out the the wig, and pulled out the gloves, and then uh, pulled out the, uh, the rifle. Martin says he kicked the safety back on the rifle so he wouldn't accidentally fire a bullet into the plane's fuselage. He put on what newspapers later described as a hippie-type wig. Then he opened the bathroom door and crouched down in the aisle at the back of the plane. And I was waving, waving to the stewardesses, but no no stewardesses uh, could see me, did see me, for about three minutes. Finally, uh, a stewardess uh, saw me, uh, and came back, and her, she was uh, a young lady, and she said, don't hurt anybody. And I said, young lady, I'm not here to hurt anybody. I'm here to uh, give the pilot uh, a, a message. And uh, I said, take this uh, note and uh, up to the pilot, and then come back here and immediately. So that's what she did. What did the note say? Did, had you written it at home? Yes, I typed it uh, at home on a typewriter, and uh, actually I had uh, the original and the carbon copy, and by mistake I gave the stewardess the carbon uh, copy, and the carbon copy didn't have the uh, red, uh, bold uh, type uh, that was on the original. So it's hard to read? 
Yeah, it, it would have been a, hard, a little harder to read, but uh, uh, the pilot got the gist of it. This is a skyjacking. Uh, all I want is the money. Here's the instructions that you need to do. Notify the FBI. I want uh, five hundred and two thousand dollars. Why the extra two thousand? Why not just make it an even that's, five? That's spent. That's spending money. That would have been pocket change. Martin says his plan was to bury the half million dollar package wherever he happened to land after he jumped out of the plane and use the extra $2,000 to get back home to Michigan, pick up his car, and drive to Canada. He would come back and dig up the half million once things had cooled down. But first, he had to get the money. The captain uh, says, uh, tells the, uh, over the intercom, he said, uh, we have a passenger that wants to go back to St. Louis, so that's what we're doing. Back then, when a hijacker made a demand, airline policy was total compliance. Martin demanded a new seat at the back of the airplane, and a flight attendant asked a family to move to make room for him. There was a dude, uh, a tall dude, his wife, and and he had two kids. So the wife got up, uh, moved, the daughter got up to move, and the son, he was about 10 or 11, 12 years old, he got up into the aisle and turned back and looked at me for a couple of seconds, 10 or 15 seconds, and just shook his head and then went, turned around and went up to the first-class section. And then the old man, uh, the, the father of the uh, family, uh, he got up and stood in the aisle, and he was about uh, four or five feet in front of me. He turned around, and he was looking at me, and uh, I was looking at him. I was staring at him. I didn't blink. And I was thinking that uh, what this guy wants to do here is charge me. He wants me to be blinking and uh, kick the uh, gun and uh, uh, subdue me. Martin says he pointed his gun at the man, and they stood there staring at each other until the man finally turned and followed his family up to first class. The pilot landed back in St. Louis. As soon as they landed, Martin says he ordered the women and children off the plane. He didn't want anyone on the tarmac to get too close, so they used the inflatable slide. And then uh, when that wasn't enough to get off, and there there were still a lot of people on the plane, I told the stewardess to tell the pilot that uh, anybody with heart problems, taking medication or old, uh, they can get off the plane too. So what the pilot did, he got on the intercom and he relayed that message. And uh, unbelievably, everybody on that plane stood up, and they were going to leave, 100% of them. Okay, they all had heart problems, apparently. He needed to think. In the end, he did decide to let almost everyone off the plane. But he kept 15 healthy men, along with the crew, as hostages. Uh, Once we got all that done, uh, they said, what next? And I said, well, we need to get this plane in the air and uh, tell the pilot to uh, refuel and uh, take us up in the air. The plane circled above St. Louis for almost five hours while banks and airlines scrambled to get together the $500,000. How are these passenger hostages doing? I mean, you were in the air with them for many hours. Were they in, what was the mood? Um, I think they they, they were in good mood. I think the moods were good. I mean, they they had no reasons to be apprehensive about uh, any serious problems, I think, but... uh, yeah, the, the, the uh, passengers were okay. At any point, though, when you were sitting there on the plane, were you feeling guilty? Were you looking at them and kind of wanting to say, I'm, listen, I'm sorry about this. I'm not actually trying to hurt you. No, no, not at all. <clears throat> of course I'm not trying to hurt them. I'm not trying to hurt anybody, myself included. That, uh, I didn't feel, no, I didn't feel guilty at all. Just after 9 p.m., the plane made its second landing at the St. Louis airport. The money was delivered in a leather mail bag and a small paper bag. Martin gave the flight attendants $2,000. He called it a tip because they'd, quote, been so nice through this thing. He had a few other demands. Two shovels, flight goggles, five parachutes, two harnesses, and an altimeter. Around midnight, Martin released all of the passengers except for one hostage. The plane was refueled for another takeoff. Everything was on schedule. And we are ready to 
take off. Um, the pilot uh, starts to gun the engine. We're rolling, rolling for takeoff. He starts to gun the engine, and then he uh, stops, puts the brakes on, and he says, uh, "There's there's something on the runway." And he says, "Oh my God! There's uh, it's, uh, it's going to hit us." A businessman named David Hanley had been watching the news of Martin's hijacking. He was sitting at the bar of the airport Marriott, watching the minute-by-minute updates about the hijacking on local TV. He told everyone at the bar to keep their eyes on the screen, got into his brand-new Cadillac Eldorado, and drove to the airport. He then drove through the chain-link fence around the runway and started driving towards the plane at 80 miles an hour. 80 miles an hour. Think of what's going to happen. The nose gear is going to collapse, and the plane, uh, the cockpit, and everything else is going to hit the uh, concrete and the tarmac. A fully loaded plane, you can talk about a major explosion there, and I'm dead. Everybody's dead at that point. But what the pilot did, he slammed on the brakes, and uh, the plane uh, bounced uh, twice. I moved up twice in my seat. I think at that point there, uh, everything came to a stop, and uh, I realized that we were really hit by some some damn fool. We're going to have to order another plane. After David Hanley smashed his Cadillac into Martin McNally's plane at 80 miles an hour, Martin didn't give up. He just asked for a new plane. This new plane would need to be fully fueled and parked as close as possible. They would all have to move from the damaged plane to this new one without anybody making a run for it and without anybody getting the chance to aim a gun at Martin. Very nervous. I was very nervous. I would say I was even scared that uh, that's a vulnerable position, and I told uh, the pilot to tell the uh, FBI on the ground that I know they got sharpshooters that are going to try to pick me off, and I know they have uh, cameras uh, trying to get uh, photos, and if I see any uh, uh, any lights, uh, uh, any lights or any beams. Uh, this thing could come to a screeching halt uh, very quick with an explosion. I said, I don't want to see any uh, hanky-panky when we uh, make the move from plane to plane. It took an hour and a half for it to arrive. When it did, Martin changed planes using two flight attendants for cover and holding his briefcase over his head. It was almost 2.30 in the morning when they took off in the new plane towards Toronto. He had hoped to take off from St. Louis by midnight and jump out of the plane by 1 a.m. But they were now hours behind schedule, which posed a problem because he knew he needed to jump before the sun came up. And uh, so that's what, that's what happened. I made the decision I had to bail out then. That's what I did. But you had never, you had never used a parachute before. Never in my life had I put on a parachute. Did you have anyone who helped you on the plane? I mean, how did you even no. know how to put this thing on? No. I tried to uh, uh, do it myself, get this uh, harness uh, situated. And as I'm doing this, uh, the four stewardesses uh, are standing around me. And I told one of them, I need to... Uh, clip these uh, leg, uh, leg straps. I need to get these leg straps put on properly. And at one point she says, I don't think we're supposed to be doing this. I said, young lady, believe me, uh, trust me, you're supposed to be doing everything I tell you to do. Now let's get this harness taken care of. So that's what happened. I mean, she, I'd be happy to get you off that plane. I'd be just yes. ready to th- throw you out the door. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess you would. He used twine to tie the 45-pound mailbag full of money to his leg. He also threaded his belt through the loop of the bag to make it more secure. And then he was ready to jump. 
I was very worried. I was very worried. And uh, uh, when I was on the plane just getting ready to uh, bail out, uh, I had uh, second thoughts, and uh, I said, uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is precarious. Uh, uh, I, uh, I have some options here. I can go up to the uh, cockpit and give him the gun and tell him this is a joke, or I can uh, kill myself, or I can uh, take a chance on uh, bailing out. I decided, well, uh, I, I better bail out. And uh, if I make it, fine. If I don't, uh, it, death comes quick. He jumped. He could only see the clouds below him. The goggles were ripped off of his head. He counted to 20 and pulled the ripcord. And when he did, the jolt of the parachute opening was so hard, the buckles on the belt holding the money bag snapped. The twine wasn't enough to hold the bag alone, and the bag went flying. The money was gone. And uh, I said, I'm going to do this again in two weeks. And uh, I landed on the ground. Yeah. And then my head slammed against the uh, dirt, and I jumped up, and I could see stars, and I heard a lot of dogs uh, barking, a lot of dogs barking. I mean, the dogs must have known something was up. But... uh, I started walking towards the trees because I knew I couldn't get a car uh, at, with my head uh, being smashed up like it was. It was pitch dark, 100%. I laid down the parachute and crawled into the parachute and went to sleep. I think it was about 5 o'clock p.m. that uh, I actually uh, uh, got up and uh, Brushed off my uh, clothes and my shoes, shined my shoes a little bit, put the parachute uh, under the tree and over some leaves, and headed out to a road. Martin had no idea where he was, but he assumed the FBI was already looking for him. He decided to hitchhike into town. Finally, a car stopped for him. The chief of police, he was something. He was with his wife. And this was about 10 o'clock. He stopped. He says, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Detroit. So he he got out of his car, and he came up to me. uh, And he said, could I see some identification? I said, sure. So I pulled out uh, my wallet. I pulled out uh, a driver's license. And he said, do you have uh, other identification? I said, sure. So I showed him some credit cards. The guy says, uh, would you like to a ride into town? And I said, well, yeah, I certainly would. Thank you. Before I get in his car, I, I pulled out my pistol and I tossed it about 20 feet. He didn't see it and his wife didn't see me do that. And uh, then I got in the car and uh, he said, it's not, it's not safe to be on the streets uh, tonight. There's a lot of excitement. And I said, yeah, I know. I've heard about uh, the uh, search that's going on here for that uh, skyjacker. So he said, yeah, there's a lot of FBI around here. I, I said, I can imagine. They drove the couple of miles into town where the police chief dropped Martin off. And my, my uh, inclination was to grab a car, hot wire a car, and get out of the area. But then, on reflection, I said, no, I can't do that. If a car comes up missing here, reported stolen, that uh, chief of police has my name, and uh, he could connect two and two. So I said, I can't do that. And I, I decided I couldn't hitchhike either. It's too hot. So I walked uh, around, and uh, I noticed a bar at the end of the road and, uh, at the street there, and uh, I walked into the bar, and, uh, got up and sat down, ordered a drink. There were about 10 or 15 people in this bar, they were, and they were looking at me. Yeah, they were looking at me. And I wondered about that. So I went into the bathroom, and I looked in the mirror, and I looked a mess. 
I looked a mess. Both eyes were uh, brown, and my chin was uh, looked like it had been ripped and a little bloody, and my hair was a mess. So, uh, yeah, I was, I, I was messed up there. He put water on his hair and combed it and tried to clean off some of the blood. He then went back into the bar and ordered a hamburger and a beer. Around midnight, he went to a hotel. The hotel clerk was listening to radio reports about the hijacker. She joked, you're not the hijacker, are you? Martin just smiled and went up to his room. I was looking out the window, looking down the street. There were a lot of cars on the street, and there were uh, two men uh, walking, walking down the street. And they weren't in suits, and they were looking in uh, windows. And, yeah, they, they, I figured they were... the. FBI. I, I understand they had about 200 FBI agents uh, searching, plus uh, local police and so forth. The money was soon found in a field by a soybean farmer. A couple of hours later, another farmer ran over the gun with his tractor. The search for Martin was intensifying. He had a friend come pick him up and drive him back to Michigan. He didn't think anybody knew who he was, So he just went home. And immediately, he started making plans to do it all again, without losing the money this time. He bragged to a friend about it, but Martin didn't know that the FBI was already watching his house. So, you do end up getting arrested? Yes. Yes, I do. Almost six days after Martin hijacked the plane, a dozen FBI agents surrounded him as he was walking home one night. They'd found his fingerprints on the plane and on the note that he'd handed to the flight attendant. They'd also searched his house and found ammunition and parts of a gun. He was charged with two counts of federal aircraft piracy. Part of his lawyer's defense was that the jump Martin made was impossible. There was no way anyone could have survived it. It didn't work. Martin was given two life sentences. And in 1973, less than a year later, airports started installing metal detectors. I wonder if you ever thought when you were in the courtroom hearing the two natural life sentences and thinking to yourself, I didn't even get the money. Yeah, of course. I said that... uh... I got two life sentences, and it cost me about two or three thousand dollars <laughs> to put the put the uh, everything together. This thing took about five months. I did a lot of driving around and uh, spending a lot of time looking at airports and uh, seeing the sights and uh, getting all the equipment uh, together, the gun, and uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I thought that. Uh, I got the life, and it cost me two grand, yeah. (laughs) You feel bad about it? Oh, God, do I feel bad about it? Uh, I I really don't know what to say. I I don't feel bad about anything. I, 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 I don't feel bad about anything. Should I feel bad? Martin was sent to Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary in Kansas, where one day a fellow hijacker knocked on his door. Knocked on my door and uh, he said, uh, can I come in? I said, yes, come on in. I said, what's up? He said, how would you like to leave this, this place in a helicopter? And I said, well, uh, I paused, well, uh, uh, I don't know. We're going to have to discuss this. We'll have to discuss the details before I make a decision on something like that. Uh, But yeah, let's, let's look into this. We'll have that part of the story in our next episode. Criminal is produced by Lauren Spohr, Nadia Wilson, and me. Audio mix by Rob Byers. Special thanks to Stephanie Cohen and Danny Wisentowski. Julian Alexander makes original illustrations for each episode of Criminal. 
You can see them at thisiscriminal.com. We're on Facebook and Twitter at Criminal Show. Criminal is recorded in the studios of North Carolina Public Radio, WUNC. We're a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX, a collection of the best shows around. Shows like 99% Invisible. They have a new series all about what we wear. Articles of Interest is produced by longtime 99% Invisible producer, Avery Truffleman, who digs into how the design of clothing affects us every day. Introducing a new six-part series from 99% Invisible. It's called Articles of Interest, and it's a show about what we wear. And so maybe the ideas about clothing. You can attach. Our ideas about class. An idea of home to a piece of cloth. These are best for last. Any fool can wear clothes, but if you ain't got the attitude and style to carry it off, man, you're just a clothes horse. Look for it in your 99% Invisible podcast feed. Learn more at articlesofinterest.club. I'm Phoebe Judge. This is Criminal. Radio Tokyo. From PR.